So ovarian masses, they can happen randomly to many patients. Uh, however, there are some uh, ovarian masses in the cancer group, which are related to some genetics malformations. In particular, there is a gene called BRCA, BRCA1 and BRCA2, and there is as well the MLH gene. These ones, they are responsible for about 10% of all ovarian cancers. However, benign ovarian masses, uh, normally, they just happen randomly and there is no genetics uh, background. Some of them, they can happen more in younger women and some of them can happen more in older women. The ones which are very well known in younger women, they are called the teratoma or the dermoid cysts. And they happen normally in the age of reproductive age um, for women who are trying to get pregnant. There is, of course, the other group of um, benign tumors called endometriomas and these ones as well they happen in younger women and they are hormone dependent some of these ovarian masses they depend on the hormones so there is estrogen uh, like in younger women they can grow more um, unlike the picture in menopausal women when there is no hormones so some other masses can happen like serous cystadenomas which they don't have any hormone receptors normally and they're not related to the menopausal status. So ovarian masses, in fact, they have uh, a wide range of symptoms. They can cause no symptoms at all, and they can cause very non-specific symptoms like bowel, irritable bowel symptoms, like um, waves between diarrhea, constipation. Uh, they can cause tummy pain, uh, they can cause pressure on other organs like the bladder and then they will cause the bladder to be overactive or more frequency in the urination. They can block the ureters and cause hydronephrosis and kidney problems and uh, no urination at all. They can block the bowels sometimes and cause bowel obstruction. And the symptoms vary between benign to malignancy. So benign masses more related to pain symptoms. Uh, however, malignant masses, they can be more related to non-specific sy symptoms like bloating, difficulty in uh, eating, feeling full quickly, and occasionally, of course, they can cause pain. So the symptoms are very wide range. I think ovarian masses can be divided into five groups. The first group is the functional ovarian masses, and these are the ones they happen as part of the normal natural cycle with a little bit of uh, derangement. For example, ovulation is known to happen every month. So sometimes the ovulation cyst can persist and cause what we call it a corpus luteum. This corpus luteum can get a bit slightly bigger with hemorrhage, but still a functional cyst. These ones, they are known to disappear on their own. They can take a few weeks before they disappear completely and they don't need any specific treatment. The second group is actually what we call it the benign masses so these benign masses they are different to the functional ones they shouldn't be there but they happen as random statistics as we said before and they can cause problems if they grow uh, bigger than five centimeters they're very common and they can be treated differently depending on the size and depending on the symptom the third type is the cancer type which is uh, as well either can be uh, invasive or primary. That means the cancer is happening um, uh, now and not be coming from another organ or can be metastatic. That means it's happened in another organ and metastasized to the ovary. And these are cancer groups. They are known to metastasize either by the, on the peritoneal surface or metastasize on the, in the blood. And these can, you know, needs to be treated in a cancer center. The fourth, uh, these are the, the third and the fourth, metastatic and primary, but the fifth one is actually what we call it a borderline. A borderline is not benign and not cancer, it's in between. They, they don't metastasize like the cancer, but they can come back if they're not taken up in, in the right way, and they have the potential to convert into cancer over time if they're not treated. Most of ovarian masses, luckily, they are benign. Okay, now 
It depends on the age. Uh, you know, the chance of malignancy goes up with age. So in women with menopause, the chance of malignancy is higher. In the woman's lifetime, there is a chance of ovarian cancer. We estimated it to be about one in 70 to one in 80 in lifetime, okay? So one in 70 to one in 80 chance compared to one in 12 for breast cancer, for example. So it's much less. And if we want to take the community in total, so the incidence of ovarian cancer in the community is one in every 2,500 women in each year. So the, the, you know, compared to benign masses, this is very much less because with benign masses, there is a chance that one in 10 women will have some type of surgery because of ovarian mass. So that is much higher than the malignancy one. So there are a few, uh, there are a few ways to diagnose ovarian masses. First, with the clinical symptoms and the investigations, including some blood tests. We sometimes ask for tumor marker to see if there is a chance for these ovarian masses to be cancerous, like a uh, most famous tumor marker is CA125. The ultrasound scan is the golden tool of diagnosis. So it does characterize the ovarian masses accurately in about say 90 to 95%. Sometimes the ultrasound scan is not possible because we cannot perform a transvaginal ultrasound scan uh, or the picture is not very satisfying or clear because of many different factors like a big fibroid uterus. In that case, we can resort to MRI. The MRI is the second option for characterizing ovarian masses after ultrasound scan because it's more you know, um, difficult to get. Uh, compared to the ultrasound scan, but it gives the same accuracy like the ultrasound scan in diagnosing the ovarian mass, whether it's benign, borderline, or malignant. Other tests like a CT scan are useful when we want to see how much the cancer is disseminated into lymph nodes or into other surfaces or into the chest. Uh, 